Um, we do not. Welcome this evening. Um, the first thing on the business is to reorganize. Um, and as folks know, we're tuned in. Um, tonight's uh, building on the agenda is the equity audit presentation. We are missing a uh, quorum from Deerfield, Conway, and Frontier. Um, and I wasn't expecting that. But so what we're going to do is move forward with um, we're going to move forward with the presentation. The presentation will be recorded, and so folks who are absent can do that. We're not voting anything this evening, so we'll be fine there. I think the next uh, operations-wise is we should vote for a chair to run this meeting. Just we're in the process of this meeting, so it's not me. I mean, I'll do it if you want, but um, and then we'll just the next time we get together in this group, we'll reorganize again in, in that kind of thing. Um, the setup of tonight's meeting is that um, Jim Farrell is here from CMSI. He'll give a presentation. This is a first a school committee meeting, so the school committee will ask questions and kind of go from there. And then we'll open up to public comment after that, okay? Just so that we have it's a lot of members of the school committee, so the open public in the middle of it is a bit much. So the first thing, Jim, hang on one second, is we agree that we should vote chair for this meeting. Okay. Can I get a nomination for chair to run this meeting. Nominate Harry Atlas. Mayor Carrie Eccles, you have a second? I'll second. Mayor Pearson, second. Any other nominations? Seeing none, closing nominations. All those for Carrie, the chair. Anyway, Trevor can't vote this evening because that's morning. All right, so Carrie, you're up. All right, thank you. Oh, so let me just introduce Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jim was a member of uh, the visiting team that was with us, with along with two other uh, members, and I'm sure he'll give a little more background on himself. But, um, Jim started his day off us this morning at 9 a.m. He met with the administrative team for two hours. In this afternoon, he met with Frontier staff and Union 38 staff as well. So he's kind of given the presentation a few times. This one's been adjusted, but I always I go too long and you're like, okay, okay. Go, go Jim, you go. You take it from here. Well, I appreciate uh, you having me back to present this to you. Uh, so I'll tell you up front, you know, this is, this is a deficit report, so you're going to hear this is where you know, uh, where you can improve that kind of stuff. But um, I will tell you that uh, you're doing a lot of tremendous good in the district, and you should really be proud of that. And it, if it doesn't come to the report, because it is a deficit report, uh, just let me say that the other equity audits that I've been a part of or read, uh, you guys are doing very well. So with that said, uh, uh, like Derry said, I'm Jim Farrell. I, I'm sure I met some of you uh, through interviews. Uh, I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, worked my way up through classroom teaching, principal, and work at the university now. And so I do uh, consulting with school districts. So all this ties together. I'm going to stay right where I am, if that's fine with everybody, because this, the cameras. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, that I want to do is honor your time here. So uh, this is a truncated version of what everybody else heard. So at any point, if you have questions, please feel free just to ask questions. Uh, so, but I want to start off by telling you as a group, this is a systems report. And it's different because we look at school districts as systems. And so you can see here this quote, the system is doing exactly what it's designed to do. Uh, and that's really a quote that drives all the work, whether it's an equity audit or a regular curriculum audit uh, that we do, is it's a systems approach. And so what we're going to do in the report is talk to you about what some of the uh, results are in your system. And then our goal is not to fix it for you. Our goal is to help you identify how to find those areas and offer suggestions on, on what to fix within the system that's going to take care of that, okay? Uh, so that's what all that says. This is also, uh, unlike a regular curriculum audit, this is a perception uh, to a great extent. Now we do talk about policies, we'll talk a little bit about policies in the end here and planning, but in general this is a lot about perceptions. And with that said, here are the uh, data sources that we use to, to create the audit. Uh, and a district this size with 1,300 or so students, uh, these numbers coming back from teachers, uh, staff, uh, and parents especially. We don't always uh, survey students, so I was excited that we got to survey students and meet some of them face-to-face. -face. 
your, the return right here was tremendous. So that in and of itself says that you're doing something that's being held on. I was in a district recently this semester, uh, tried to do it on one of these semesters that had 7,000 students and the return rate was lower than what you did. So you should be proud of that in and of itself is just an indication that what you're doing, uh, you have buy-in. Uh, we looked at student work and we reviewed a lot of documents. So you can read the report. It is organized into focus areas and stuff. What I'm doing is I'm just talking about themes that emerged out of the report. So this is a synthesis of the whole report. And there are four themes here. Okay, the first one is the uh, cultural competency continuum and where we see you on that continuum. We'll talk a little bit about the district demographics and some microaggressions that are happening, uh, academic achievement, and then finally governance. And so with that, let's start with the cultural competency continuum. So in the report, it was pointed out that uh, initially we had said you're at the uh, cultural pre-confidence, the green area there. Uh, but as I went through and read more equity audits this summer and realized just where you guys are, I really think that you are more in the cultural confidence now. Okay, so we can't change the report, it's been finalized, but uh, take pride in the fact that you're in this, in the blue area. And I'm not going to read everything to you on the slides, but I do want to read this because it says uh, what I'm talking about. It says aligning your personal values and behaviors and policies and practices in a manner that is inclusive of cultures that are that are new or different from yours and the schools, and it enables healthy and productive interactions. And then the blue says, you see the difference and you value it. So I think that uh, based upon not just the uh, survey results and reading all that, but in looking at all the others, we were probably pretty harsh in judging you and saying that you're at the cultural pre confidence. I really think that you're probably further along than you usually thought. So, uh, areas of strength, obviously, you know that uh, the work that you started in 2020 uh, is, is unique. This is not done uh, all over the country. And so you're seeing the benefits of that now. Uh, overall perceptions from the surveys and interviews is that while there's still work to be done, a lot of it has been accomplished, hence where we put you on that cultural uh, competency continuum. So just to hit a little bit of the demographics here, because your demographics are going to come through when we're looking at it through this equity lens. Uh, the fact that 84% of your students are white or 16% are non-white, however you want to look at that, and that free and reduced lunch of 25.2. Pretty low in general, but we see both of these uh, data points in uh, the data that we look at. Okay, and so I wanted to point those two things out to you. Uh, the rest of this is fairly uh, in line with the state. So, as we said, a lot of work has been done. Uh, stakeholders generally agree that the district is moving in a positive direction. And as I told the other groups, um, you know, anytime you're in a leadership position, you're trying to do some type of initiative, you can typically expect, you know, about 10 to 15 percent pushback on what you're doing. I and mean, you're just not going to get everybody to agree. I did not see that in the surveys. And we did see negative responses. There were a few in there, okay, but it was not 10 to 15 percent of those responses. Just every now and then you saw, you know, we're done with this, we need to move on, that kind of stuff. Very few, uh, very minimal. In general, though, I think that's a, that's a uh, very accurate statement to say the district is moving in a positive direction. Your DEI work that you're doing is a journey. It's not a one-time event. Um, you know, I look at this as an analogy of, of when the uh, medieval emperors would, uh, would, would start cathedrals. You know, they would start building a cathedral knowing they're never going to see it built. But that's what you're doing here. So again, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna pat you on the back where we need it. Um, this is the recommendations, okay? And so we're gonna touch on how these come about in about the next 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation. Work on creating policies that require processes that we're gonna outline, and I'll give you an example of that. Work on creating an actual equity plan, and we've already been talking about that with leadership on what that might look like. 
and some ideas on how to do that. Um, develop a student information system that allows for all aspects of equity analysis. Uh, you know, when we want to pull uh, student data, we had some issues with pulling student data, and the, the data were there, it's just that we're pulling it from multiple sources. And uh, so in order to do this effectively, you don't want to be, you don't want to do that. So that's already been addressed, as you know. And then work on professional development to enhance some of the uh, other key areas. So the second area that arose, so can, uh, the continuum, good spot, good work, it shows. The second area of district demographics and microaggressions. So here we, uh, not only did we survey students, we also interviewed students and teachers uh, and so forth. This is not, this is normal. You know, the demographics, we would hope the demographics represent uh, the diversity that is in your student body. Doesn't quite do it as far as employees. So the, the one thing obviously that stands out with uh, education system is typically you have more white female teachers. Okay, not a surprise there. So when your student body is almost split 50-50. Uh, the one thing that stood out from the student surveys as a strength is that uh, students, and I think this is the result of just being in 2023, were uh, very diverse in their sexual identities. About 80% of them identified as heterosexual, which meant that that's 20% who identified other. And so not only do you have that 16% who are non-white, the free reduced SES, if 20% of your student body uh, who identifies as something other than heterosexual. So you have a lot of diversity within your student body uh, as well. Uh, so microaggressions, uh, microaggressions, we, we talked about this with student groups, we talked about this with teachers and administrators, and these happen, and it's, it's an equity issue in the sense that uh, when it's happening, it's typically in hallways, or in a classroom, if it's before a teacher gets in there, and it's the use of racial slurs or sexual orientation slurs, those kinds of things. Uh, that's what the students are concerned about. Um, the, uh, when we asked about this, the, the topic that came and kind of arose at this, and I should add here that almost all of these surveys questions had open-ended uh, responses and, and people could leave comments. Many of them did not. If they did, that's when I went through them and read through them to try to see what kind of a theme is emerging, if there's a theme. And one of the themes that emerged here was that students just weren't always clear what would happen if they were reported things. Okay? And so that's a policy issue uh, that we can address. So that's the microaggression side and how that's impacted by equity. Uh, academic achievement, this is where those demographic numbers that I mentioned really start to show. Uh, and in order to understand the academic side, I want to talk about access and opportunity. Access is just equal access, okay? For example, if we want somebody to take an AP class, they just enroll in an AP class and they take it. Opportunity is that long-range vision of are students prepared to succeed? in the AP class, and in general, they're not always prepared. You know, research shows that students who come from low SES families enter kindergarten already behind. So you already know that 25% of your students are behind their peers when they enter kindergarten. So opportunity then comes into play. How are we doing extra? What are we doing to prepare those students who are already starting at a disadvantage? Uh, that's the equity work and where it comes in. These numbers come through in your data, okay? Here are your achievement data for the last few years. You flip back and forth with the state. Sometimes you're above the state, sometimes you're below the state. You're generally aligned with the state as a group, as an organization. Um, you know, you can always do better when the state is looking at 30 and 40%. You know, that's still meaning that 50% of the students are not efficient or more. Uh, when we start breaking the data down, this is when we see those demographics that, that require you to think, how can we enhance opportunity for these students? Your low SES, that 25.2 is, I keep going back to that number, that's one in four kids 
are significantly performing lower than their peers who are not offering a reduced lunch. And uh, as I said to the group earlier, we don't use statistical analysis in the reports. Uh, they're generally sent for uh, writings to read, somebody not associated with education at all. So we would not use the word statistically significant, but I'm using it here because I'm telling you, if we were to run the studies, this would be a statistically significant gap between your low income and non low income students, I believe. I believe we, we did not run those studies. But, uh, on the other hand, when we look at SAT scores, SAT is an optional test. Your students are blowing it out of the water, they're killing it. Uh, the green are your male students and their average in the last few years. And this is a lot of years, you can see the trends here. Uh, the blue are the female, and then the orange is the national average. So both male and female are just killing it every year on your AP courses. And your AP, uh, uh, I think I have a slide for AP, so we'll look at that in a second. Your PSAT scores, PSAT, these are a little bit different. Okay, AP is, is unique in the sense that those students choose to take AP. So those are the bright students who are prepared and ready for the rigor that is there. And we'll see in a second, those students do very well in AP. SAT, the same way. Those students choose to take the SAT. PSAT, everybody takes. And here we see the equity concerns that we've talked about. You can see there are some differences between those on paid lunches and those who are on pre and reduced lunches. And some of those gaps widen. Now I will add uh, in the report, it gives the actual numbers uh, so I wouldn't stress too much about grade 11 because those were very low numbers. I think that's an anomaly. Uh, but grades 8, 9, and 10, those, you can see there are gaps there. And this is also where you do see that 15%. We really can't see those numbers. So if you just, just do oh, okay. them out loud for those of us who are here, that gotcha. kind of help that. For example, then, in uh, grade 8, uh, your paid lunches ranked at the 64th percentile, your free and reduced lunch at the 42nd, almost. So 18 percent percentile difference there. A uh, little bit better grade nine. Uh, paid lunches were at the 65th percentile, free and reduced was at 54. Grade 10, almost a 20 point spread. Uh, your paid lunches were at 64 percentile, and your free and reduced were at 45. So we see some significant gaps there. Uh, and then when we look at race, in grade 9 and 10, we see some significant gaps there. Grade 9 Y students scored at the 67th percentile, while all others scored at the 46th. So 17 points, or 19 points. 21 points. Uh, in grade 10, 64 percentile for Y compared to 41 percent for all others. So we do see those gaps there uh, as well. Uh, <clears throat> access and equity. Uh, advanced placement course enrollment. You know, it's just a phenomenon here that you have so many females enrolled in your AP courses compared to males. And we'll look at the next slide that shows that. Uh, but that's the uh, the highlight on here. The next slide will show that. What I will, will read to you is the bottom one. The bottom one talks about low income. So keep in mind, uh, you're at 25.2%. Uh, in 2023, you had 8% of students in AP courses who were low income. So we would want to see that up higher, even closer. Okay. Um, the breakdown between gender, uh, oops, I will read it to you a little bit here. I thought I had a slide in there, but I took it out for you guys. Um, the females are typically anywhere from 20 to 30% more in, in class than males. So, for example, in 2023, 60% of uh, AP students were females, 40% were males. Okay, it's, it's just the phenomenon that it is. Uh, honors enrollment, so this is a different track to your lower high school. Uh, the gender gap disappears here in your honors classes. The low SES uh, is still there. It's closing, but it's still there. So, for example, in 2023, whereas in AP you had 8% students, in the honors courses, the uh, 9th and 10th grade, you get 13% of your students 
who are low SES. So we're closing that gap a little bit. Okay. That's where I talk about opportunity, you know, uh, and this is where it starts in the lower grades, the elementary, you know, how can we provide opportunity to uh, to close these gaps that, that your low SES students are bringing in. Curriculum, the only thing I want to mention about your curriculum is that you, you do have an excellent curriculum management plan. Um, it is the only one I've seen that actually specifically has a characteristic for culturally responsive curriculum in there. Um, this was the least developed of the area in the 50 documents. I think that we uh, looked at 50 different curriculum documents. So there's room to grow there. Uh, but you do have it. I've never seen that before. So kudos to uh, you guys for that. So a summary of your academic achievement. Again, your low SES students are struggling. You have a solid foundation on curriculum development. Even when we were here in the spring, we were seeing curricular documents that were updated just this spring. Um, and then the curriculum management plan, the least developed area is that uh, uh, culturally responsive teaching, but it's there. So you don't have to invent the, that piece of it. And finally, the last piece is governance. Uh, and governance here, the, this is talking about your policies and plans. Let me give you an example of policy. So you have an equity policy, JBD is your equity policy. Uh, and it's a good policy. Uh, you know, we always see policies that say, you know, we're going to treat students equally or, or something to that effect. But you actually have an equity policy. Uh, an example of tightening that up, in there you, you require the superintendent to uh, include equity as part of the strategic plan. That's good. Uh, you tell them to, I think you used the word periodically, I can't remember. Periodically report to the board. That's where we want to see some tightening up. Okay. And what is it exactly that he's going to look at? So that's the development of a plan and tightening up some policies like that. So that uh, every year you can expect to see equity debt. You know, I would expect that in within a couple of years, you're probably going to see projections of, hey, this is where our free and reduced kids are right now, and this is based upon trends. This is what we expect it to look like in five years out, free and reduced. And if you're able to do that and start planning that, that's a very progressive district. School districts don't do that. But the foundation that you've laid with all the work you had, you're allowed to start doing stuff like that. So, uh, DEI is driven by your strategic plan, the school plans, your curriculum plan, your professional development, and your foundation statement on, on anti-racism and equity. We just say make a plan. You're going to tie all these plans in there, but have a physical plan as well. And we're going to, I'm going to help Sarah more with that as we go on. So summary again, just strengthen your policies and create your plan. Okay, pull it all together into a single plan. So questions. Again, that was a pretty short presentation compared to the actual report and stuff from this morning, but I would be happy to answer all your questions. Yeah, so I was curious in the, um, in a, a lot of the questions that came out in the, the full report, do you have a breakdown of who was experiencing what, like the responses of the people, of 20% of the people, who uh, answered a question were experiencing some sort of microaggression? Were they all part of a minority demographic and therefore it's right. a little more significant? Yeah, so that's a good question. And one of the teachers asked that question too. Uh, we did not break down the data that way. Uh, we probably could, uh, but number one, it's, it's, an, it's an expense. But number two, you know, even if you know, you know, I was thinking through this as, as this teacher was asking this today. Uh, you know, so let's say that you do have, a, you know, it's only one group of students who are reporting saying that this is happening to us. That's still one group of students who are reporting that. So, no, we, to answer your question, we did not do that deep of an analysis. I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm not saying that it's not significant of the exact group, but it's really significant if it's all those people yes. that are Yes, all three, yes, 100%. But no, we did not break it down. 
uh, that way. And then, you know, that may be something that we could suggest in the future, um, just to see, you know, the equity audit's been around, the curriculum audit has been around for over 40 years. This equity audit is about five years old. So looking at those data in, in that light, doing that type of analysis might shed even more light on what's happening. Yes, sir. So the statistical analysis, the, the PSAT, SAT, and AP scores, mm -hmm. when you're looking at those statistics, I like the PSAT the better of the three, because SAT, AP, those are kids very sort of on a track. Yes. And, and those often come from higher income families who are very practice tests. And so that, that difference in the scores could be you know, biased a little bit. Not to mention, you know, stories and research about the college boards, SAT and AP questions sometimes being somewhat biased anyway. <clears throat> so do you guys address that at all in some way? I think that the PSAT is a little bit um, easier to use, I think, because it's not, especially if you start in eighth grade, it's mm -hmm. not students that have been practicing for three years, because that, that does separate the percentages when students are you know, working with their families to get better at mm -hmm. standardized tests. I, I don't know that we address it like that. We do, I, I believe that we address it. First of all, we just show you the data, right. you know. So you know that your students choose to take AP or choose to take the SAT and they require to take the PSAT. So other than saying that in there, we don't go into it yet other than that. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I just I guess I'm just looking at you know that those scores sometimes are gonna be separate no matter what we're doing. You know, oh yeah, I, one at home. I think that the PSAT is probably a better idea yeah. of seeing what's happening, but I did want to show you your AP scores because you're just killing it in your SAT scores. So what we you know hope to do is to get those others up there so they can take those classes and achieve as well. So did, did I answer all your question as well? Or I have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I got time. Go I got time. Yes. Really get to that question. Um, the data wasn't broken down about who self-reported the microaggressions, but did you see trends in the narratives around the types of topics that were um, coming up? If, uh, from what I remember, the trends in the microaggressions were pretty much uh, the N-word in the hallways, where if the teacher wasn't there, or the F word to sexual orientation, the teacher wasn't there. Those were the kinds of things. It wasn't physical or anything like that. Going off that, uh, I was wondering, were you able to break out between the elementary schools and mm -hmm. middle school, high school? We didn't you? look at it. We don't break it down that way. Either. We give it to you as a system. Uh, in fact, I think there's one point in there where we did talk about the, the schools. But in general, you'll see them called elementary school one or elementary school two. Just to add it on that, so it's important as individual school committee members that those numbers do shift. The, the, the SES, in your, I know we have some of the elementary schools, so we say SES, so that's going to be good. Your social economic status um, does fluctuate from town to town, okay? So yeah. it's important that when we go back, you go back to your hometown and we look at our MCAS scores that we'll be talking about later this year and that kind of stuff, that it does does adjust, but this is the district as a whole. And you know, Frontier yeah. looks different than the, the, all the total numbers there. It isn't actually Frontier's numbers either. It's, it's a little bit different, but yeah. it's just important that it is, you'll see those shifts. you be like, I thought it was 24%. Oh, it's actually higher at Frontier. It's 27%. So you know, that, you know, it depends on what you know, town you're in. Kind of stuff. So there, you're gonna see that with the data, but the trends are the same. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You don't also know the overlap in the data between somebody who identifies as not heterosexual, of a racial minority, of a lower socioeconomic. No. You know, so it's not really we have that much diversity because those could have multiple diversities in that group. Correct. The intersection is, I'm sure there's an intersection there, but we yeah. don't look at that. No. But it also, okay, just also when we talk about data, the one thing that was pointed out, and he mentioned it, Jim mentioned it earlier, but is that we don't have a good data system that we can easily say, 
you know, students of poverty who are female, who are in, enrolled in two AP courses, who are, you know, that kind of, you know, we don't, we can't pull that all at once. It's each one's an individual search and whatever. And part of one of the recommendations is you really need a database to look at inequities that can house the different information. And it also, when we talk with elementary school teachers, more data came from Frontier because we have more of this data that's um, in the system that was easier, you know, we don't, the amount of testing, you don't have PSAT or the like, you know, maybe we could do the NWA scores or something like that, but there's only so much that we have in the system and we need to create more so that we can find other patterns and identify those patterns and address them. Yeah, I'll give you a prime example, and I don't know who your your dad person was who I think her name is Dana. Sure. Dana? Megan. 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 Is Megan here? No. Oh, okay. So when I okay, well, when I asked for AP data, Megan used something called Looker Studio, which I've seen. I don't know, I was jealous she figured out. I don't know how many hours she spent doing that, which in you know in the long run, you know, it's just you know a week or so, but that's what we're talking about, data system. But we can easily now with that program that she put together and put all your AP stuff in there, we can do that and say, well, how many females who were low SES took AP land? It's that simple now. But she had to make that. How will you know SES if if lunch is for because that's how you know. That's the only way we measure. Right, but so, now yeah. lunches are free in Massachusetts. So oh, that's, yeah. yeah. So people aren't going to have to fill out the form applying for free lunch. So okay. how are we going to track that data point and socioeconomic status if that point goes away? Correct. So that, I'll answer that because it's a state question. Yeah. You have 50 of them. Um, I don't know if you go states, but you do many things <laughs> to talk about. Um, so they are working on that. Um, right now, we get the data for those who are enrolled in SNAP and like programs. Okay. So we get that information from the state, and it goes into our. It's, and now there's more database sharing with the state than ever before, um, Big Brother. Um, but so we have that information. What we don't have is if people qualify for SNAP, aren't enrolled in SNAP, right. but normally would have signed up for previous lunch. So then we ask them to volunteer to sign up, which is not bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's a problem. In this, district, in, this, in this district had a problem. In this district had a problem prior to that because we had a lot of families who we knew could qualify for green lunch, didn't feel like they needed to. I was going to say because we, have, we that also have these towns that has a different type of poverty. There's some agricultural poverty, which yeah. is very different than urban poverty. Um, so it's. Um, you know, anyway, so it was a problem we had to begin with, and now it's, it's even it's doubled down because at least we can convince people. Super hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are not that comes up too when districts become uh, district wide Title I and they stop taking lunches. So it's not just Massachusetts, it happens in other states. Yeah. A lot. So we do have some families submitting applications because there's still some families that need it for their own um, efforts as well. Yeah. That maybe aren't going to pull in the direct certification. So the numbers aren't 100% accurate, but we are collecting some of that data and it does still exist. And we'll keep working to do that. I won't say it's completely broken, but there's certainly a soft spot. I mean, it, it, yeah. The numbers are off on it. So you could probably inflate that by 5%. You know what I mean? Or you have those people who are near the line. You know what I mean? So, it was, so you didn't qualify by a thousand bucks. Congratulations. You know what I mean? And <laughs> that kind of, you know, so. You know, if you look at those numbers, don't think everybody about that is just you know, economically free. Yeah. I think in the bigger picture, it's it's putting those systems in place that help create. Now that you can identify that maybe there are not the opportunities that are necessary to help support low-income students in place, or maybe they're in place and not effective, by working toward that, you're going to raise them all. Yeah. That's definitely the ideal. Getting into yeah, it. you got to be in action. I'm an internal optimist. Yes, I am too. <laughs> <That's laughs> That's that hardly becomes difficult if your number for those books becomes smaller because you're not actually tracking them. Now your mm -hmm. data is based on a very small yeah. population. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Come back. Come back. Well, so I, I had some 
concern about some of the observations of my uh, observed racist speech or behavior among students, that the observations among administrators is so significantly different than staff who may have more interactions with students during downtime. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that the professional development for staff is at the same level as it is for teachers and administrators. And I'm, I, that's certainly a concern with how do we address that. Well, again, I think it's putting systems in place. Uh, you know, so tracking, one of the things that we talked about is tracking, you know, the effectiveness of professional development. And, uh, you know, a part of the equity plan uh, is to put some metrics in there. How are we going to measure these things? And then what are we going to see over time? And you're expending dollars. That's what your job is as a committee, is to grant these dollars. Uh, you know, are you seeing a return on investment for what you're doing? Uh, if you're not tracking that stuff right now, putting these systems in place are going to help you do that. Because it seems like this concern also pairs with some of the student concerns that you brought up that they're not sure about reporting it because what's going to happen is you go back to people who don't see it as it's most of an issue. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a, a very, very serious concern. Yeah, and so one of the things, you know, to, to really look at, we talked about student surveys as well, is, you know, those, you know, doing student surveys and then looking at trends. You know, you don't have to get as complicated as we did on the student survey, but, you know, look at trends in the student surveys. You know, what were the, the big, celebrations three years ago and what were the big concerns and how have those gaps are the celebrations still high and have we closed that gap uh, of those reporting those concerns i'm going to guess that's not happening right now just because it's not you know as you're thinking about things to do you know that kind of stuff yeah it's a good idea you know we can, that's what an equity plan is going to help you do Yes, back to the, the metrics for professional development in this area, do you help us with that? I mean, that, I, I know metrics for a lot of other, you know, observations of teachers and staff and administration and students, but this one's a tricky one. I mean, how, do you have experience with other places who've done metrics for professional development in, um, in this specific? Area? Yeah. Again, the direct answer is no. What I would tell you is, uh, obviously, Sarah is going to be a great resource to reach out to. Uh, a lot of professional development when I work. So right now, what I do in, in my other life is I train principals. Uh, I can't remember if I said that's what I actually do. We talk about classroom observations a lot, and we talk about how uh, you know you you have you know a set of things that you're looking for in there, but you might have a few things that hey, we've done PD on this, and we spent you know, $30,000 on this, so let's monitor this this year to see that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a simple observation like that. The other thing would be to do surveys. So that's just off the top of my head, direct, uh, work with it, no. But that's where that's where my mind goes when, when we talk about things like that. So the observing the classroom and see what the language is being used and you know, are you using proper pronouns and, and uh, Proper balance of questioning of all the students and, and, and uh, interaction. Is that yeah, what, you know, whatever that PD is that you're that you're working with. If you're doing PD on uh, using high levels of balloons, okay, when you, when you're interacting with kids, so let's train our principals that hey, when we go in, let's monitor the level of balloons that we see from teacher to students. Okay. And then we'll record that. And as you do that over the year, you can see is this increasing or is it still the same? That yeah, that's that's my thoughts on that. And just to jump in, and we've done that, we've done some of that work like that before with the curriculum. So we brought in professional development and then we created our own observation form to look for some of those things. So yeah. a few years back, you know, we were talking about differentiation was a big push we were doing. We also looked at like active and passive learning. And you know that kind of thing, and so we had little check boxes so that we could try to see if we were seeing change. You know, you know then you know COVID and all those things. But it's also hard. Um, this is where we have to work with the second. How do you track it? You know, in some ways, it's going to be observational. 
yeah, if yeah. it feels better, you know, like we're, if people are talking about it better, like I can say we've made progress in inter-recent equity work just in the conversations I'm having with people. But I didn't measure the conversations three years ago when we started this work. You know what I mean? I can tell you, I said we're on an admin meeting this morning and the depth of our conversation and um, just people, you know, firing stuff out and different concerns. Like we weren't there three years ago, but we didn't measure where we were three years ago either. So, oh, yeah, we'll, you be talk, never, we'll be talking about how, because we could not get plan, if I'm going to be responsible for the, yeah. the, the, the meters being met, you know, I've got to make sure that they can be. And then, I also said this before, you may also make goals and not reach those goals. And then what do you do? You know, that kind of stuff. And so, yeah. And what degree of training did the staff have in addressing these kind of concerns? They don't have any professional development around addressing racism or microaggressions. Well, it's yeah. funny you should bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was very interesting. So, Carpenter, QPD Fridays, we had. Um, uh, training on microaggressions, and we were able to have all of our faculty as well as our instructional assistants and anybody in the building that was available to do it was given an auditorium. We had a, a person from, um, they work for two things, they work for the gender and they also work for uh, the SEC schools projects, um, and we worked with them before. So it was, it was yeah, we were able to get here with a couple of people. You know. yeah, and I guess it kind of flows into because, like, you know, as we're doing this, we're seeing, you know, we've had conversations like, you know, Jim, give me some heads up, like, yeah, you guys, you might progress, you guys, you know, like, we saw, you know, some preliminary reports and that kind of stuff. So we already started building the professional development plan to look at some of these things. And I'm just going to keep going about what we are, where we are right now, um, kind of transitioning. Um, but so the administrative team met over the summer and, you know, really, and folks, you know, at home and whatnot, if you look at the recommendations in the full report, that right there is kind of the is kind of where we zeroed in because a lot of the different data you can get caught up like what does this data mean that but you go to the recommendations and say this is the path ahead the road plan of like which are you going to take and are you going to address these different things and so we started to map out what that looks like and what was interesting in our conversation this morning was talking about accountability to that map and our map really didn't have accountability it's like we need to address for example the administrators are not training regarding hiring biases we have three trainings this fall with an outside group name of it, but um, you know, we're, that's part of our professional development there. Um, it's in the plan, you know, that kind of thing, but how do we see if it, you know, you, you know, we went and got training, but how are we going to see what are the, the goals? And that's the part where, you know, we had a long conversation this morning about within each part of it. So the plan for administratively wise that we have this in production, we want to create an equity plan that kind of works with it. We really love it because it's, it's very visual friendly. Like you can see you know, timelines out and that kind of stuff. So, um, but we're also looking at the um, equity plan. So we're going to develop that in the next few months, bring it back to school committee and say, this is where we want to go and so on and so forth. So that's kind of where we see things unless you direct yourself to it. You know what I mean? But that's kind of what we're kind of building these behind the scenes. We're not, yeah, we're not waiting, so to speak. And so there are ongoing professional developments that are straight out as report concerns. Some which we, you know, you kind of knew you take your car and you kind of know what some of the things are wrong with it before you bring it in. You know, we kind of knew that you know, looking at um, looking at bias and looking at uh, microaggressions and those kind of things are things that we're in that report. So, so why you're wearing your rainbow socks today? I have a whole array of socks. And I need to. Just check. Um, so yes, so that's kind of where we're. I kind of jumped ahead, but that's kind of the next steps for I see for us administratively unless we get to right and there has to be continuity as they develop this equity plan. There's continuity. It has to tie into your strategic plan. And uh, Sarah and I were talking about how it's naturally going to tie into curriculum as well. So, well, I mean, you talking about curriculum, and, and the folks from the elementary school, this is really what people watching, but folks from the elementary school got from, you know, Laura met them at the last school committee meetings to talk about the new ELA program. Well, one of the major focus in that new ELA program was having the diversity of materials and that it focused on um, culturally responsive curriculum. And so that was one of the, we call the indicator, but that was an indicator that made those on the top, of, in the top of the list, to make sure that it has that. So we're adopting a new curriculum that's gonna have this embedded. No longer it's gonna be, oh, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, getting, looking for materials to have, you know, diversity within my curriculum. 
um, and showing um, different subgroups of our population. That nice. this, you know, we, that was kind of important. So we've already now it's worked those happen in the spring. It's not in this report. I don't know if it came up in the report, but that's the curriculum movement that we're already we're doing as well. So again, a lot of things in motion with this stuff involved and in communicating the uh, back out, putting it all in one place in the plans. Daunting task ahead. It's a journey. So uh, this is a kind of question for Jim and all the committees to think about as we move forward. You've been doing this DEI work for three years and have some ideas for how to move forward now. Uh, and we're still seeing you know, the difference in test scores. We're seeing like progression, we're seeing bullying. Mm -hmm. When did that gap start to close in your experience? If we do everything we're supposed to do, what can we expect to see, the actual differences that the students are experiencing? You know, uh, there's a little district uh, that in Oklahoma, uh, 450 kids, so a tiny K district, and their A plus school recognized by the White House on them 15 years ago. Or so a cousin of mine works there. And I went and visited. And I said, How do you do this? And she basically said, We treat every student as an individual. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that. We're, that's what differentiation is, and we're going to do that. But um, it's intentional. Okay, it's intentional. Uh, they meet regularly. And I'm just telling you their process. They meet regularly, review what they're going to do the next week. They do it. They look at the data. They decide who needs remediation. They remediate and move, keep moving forward. That's a small little district that can be done. You can start to see some gaps closing, okay? For example, when it comes to your honors courses, you see about half the students are free and reduced, whereas in your uh, AP courses, it was less, it was like 8%. Uh, I think intentionally thinking about these things, okay? So when we talk about opportunity and creating opportunity, it's not just introducing diversity, the curriculum, which is one of the things that we would look at as well and, and want to see. But it's also realizing that, hey, we have 25% of our kids coming to school from uh, free and reduced families. And research shows that they come with limited vocabularies compared to their peers. So what are we doing to do simple stuff like that? And that's where I think you can start looking at Hey, we. Th th this is that opportunity aspect of creating these opportunities, so you can create this pipeline. How long does it take? I don't know. But what we can do, and I'll kind of what you can do, is as you start looking specifically at these data points, you can see that what you're doing is either working or not working, and that's when you can start really to make more informed, data informed decisions. If that makes sense. It seems like the um, kind of the, the area of focus is the wraparound services for the families. Like, how do we get that kind of not just for the kids, but their their whole life? How, what what can school district, what can towns do as a whole village to kind of wrap around that services to try and get try to equalize that? Because as you were mentioning earlier before the meeting, it's just you know. Family dynamics are different, and some, you know, you have one parent who works in three jobs or two jobs, and they don't have, they don't come prepared, they don't have those wraparound services that, a, that a, you know, two family high earners would would just naturally. So just trying to find those ways to kind of bring those services all the way around, so that you can get you can get those kids to have have more opportunity to take the AP classes to do that and stuff. Just trying to recognize where where we as a, as a village can make a difference. And that goes to the conversation we had this morning in the uh, Edmund meetings. We were talking about free reduced lunch, and, and most many of those students are are students that will come and go from us as well. Right. You know, and a more often I think you know people are hiring on time moving, but they'll come and go, or they didn't start with us, they come late. And what is the transition process? Um, you know, those kind of things, and those are areas that we can also look at. And improve. Um, you know, the wraparound services, it's, it's a big, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a big, but there is this, like, are we, are they individuals within our system? And do we have, and can we create something that, right from the beginning, it says, you know, how can we support, yeah, um, 
especially students who, who are you know aren't stable in our system. Right. I, I think you know, we see a lot of you know yeah it happens a lot with our, our dropouts and as well. Is it, it's many many times not people have been with us all the way or you know their lives have been bounced around and that kind of thing. So right. they're fighting they're fighting even before they walk with the Absolutely. Yeah, and it may be a pie in the sky response too, you know, but we were talking earlier as well that, you know, the fact that, you know, we believe that education as you do is the equalizer. This is what's going to help equalize society, you know, equal in opportunity so that every student can, can graduate with any option that he or she wants. Um, and so, yeah, you know, again, you know, I'll pat you on the back a little bit that. Um, you know, you can easily hide behind the very strong numbers that you have, but you're willing to take on this challenge. Are we ever going to get there and eradicate it so that we can look at a test score and not see demographics? Maybe, maybe not, but if you're going there, you're heading in that direction. So, again, that's my pie in the sky response that might seem a little trite, but. Again, kudos for the work that you're doing. I jumped in there because you just referred to one of the things that I wanted to ask about. Uh -huh. um, there's lots of references in the report to test scores, not just in examining our SATs and PSATs and MCATs, but also when you get into the um, instructional stuff, you keep talking about instructional practices mm -hmm. that will improve test scores. As a teacher, I feel like tests are not really a great measure of the fullness and completeness of the educational experience we're offering. What a test measures is how well a kid can take a test on the day they took the sure. test. It's not measuring everything else that we want them carrying out into the world. Um, and I didn't see much nuance in the report about that. Can you talk to us for our future examination of our data about the usefulness versus the limitations of that data point? And I'll, I'll, just, yeah. I'll own that I'm biased against standardized tests. So that's fine. feel free to illuminate the other side for me. No, you know, what I tell people uh, is number one, they're not going away. Yeah. So we, that's reality. We have to deal with it. Okay. So when we look at instructional strategies, research shows that high rigor can actually help mitigate the impact of SES. Challenging students can help mitigate that. Uh, is that happening? Now, what I didn't show you is uh, we went into we 60 some classrooms. You know, there's a whole part in there about what we looked at when we went into the classrooms. 28%, uh, I believe it was 28%, were in mid to high level reports. That's really good. Okay, now that might not sound good because if you look at those standardized tests, they do give you blueprints and they're probably going to tell you, hey, this eighth grade test has 60% in the mid level. 20% in low and 20% high, okay? So that 28% might not sound good, but keep in mind, that was a two to three minute observation on that particular day. We don't see 28% when we go in. So there's good instruction happening here, okay? So if that doesn't come through, uh, just keep that in mind, okay? The other thing is, we know that students learn when they become well engaged. And as opposed to a typical high school, I was this high school teacher who had them in nice rows. Okay, um, that's the least engaging and, and least learning environment, as you know. Uh, so when we look at those teacher strategies, we saw that, but that was in the minority. When you look at the other engaging strategies, we saw a lot of engaging strategies happening in the classroom. So I agree that that one test is not a measure of a student, but in reality, it has to be done, and there's just no getting around that. So I hope that when you read that part about what's happening in the classrooms, that it comes across, again, it's a deficit report, but there are a lot of good things happening in the classroom. We, try, we, we don't compare districts to other districts, okay? But when I tell you that I see, saw 28%, in mid to high level rooms, typically we see 92, 93% in remembering and understanding, and maybe zero in uh, evaluating and creating. So you have good things happening here. I don't think, I don't know that that answers your question. Uh, there's no getting around the test, so we just have to do the best we can to get the students prepared. But do you do, you do picture a future? where 
standardized test results are going to show where you will, we will not see demographic discrepancies. That's the goal. That's, that's, that's the ultimate goal. You, you have to believe that you'll get there, otherwise why even start the journey? So you have to believe that you'll get there. Can I ask I one? Of it. Oh, I, I do not disagree. One of my good friends wrote a book about standardized testing, the, the testing industrial complex or something. I mean, yeah, I'm completely with you on it. Uh, but that's the reality. We can't not do it. You know, that, uh, you know, for my two cents here, you know, education history, when, when No Child Left Behind tied accountability to federal funding, that box will never be closed, ever. So tests are here. Now, how much we do in-house compared to what is required by the government, we do have a little bit of control. And that we can, I believe, eliminate the more effective and viable our curriculum has, and the more we teach to mastery and students are learning. We don't have to test them as much as we can see that they're learning. So in a sense, I can see districts who truly embrace creating and teaching to mastery, which is what my cousin's district in Oklahoma does. I can see that eliminating some of that testing, but we're never going to get rid of high stakes. That's, I think that's here, at least for our lifetime. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with yeah. that part. I just, in terms of our future evaluations, I, I, I would love to just hear a little bit of encouragement to de emphasize the standardized test because it is such a limited measure of the fullness of what we are offering, trying to offer students. Yeah, and I will say, I think that this equity audit, as opposed to a regular curriculum audit, I think the curriculum audit itself is pretty much all geared toward that idea. This has that been, it's still there, uh, but it's not the primary focus of this. So I don't know if you were here when, when they had the curriculum audit about 10 years ago. Yeah, that audit is directed primarily toward the testing. Yeah. I one quick question. You would, uh, just for clarity, uh, and I'm not <laughs> in education, so when you say Bloom's? The Bloom's taxonomy is how we measure questioning, a level of questioning, sorry. No, okay. There are six levels to it. And uh, so test blueprints typically tell you, hey, this test has 50 questions and this many are going to be in the two mid levels. This okay. many are going to be in the high, and this many are going to be in the low. Okay. We typically would expect to see more low level questioning in lower elementary because we're teaching them simple things and we want them sure. to remember and understand. As we get into high school, we middle school and high schools, we go up, we want to see more of those high level questions. Thank you. So, yeah, that's just I'm curious. Yes, sir. Um, I'm on the uh, school committee. Of Sunderland Elementary, mm -hmm. and I'm struggling with the takeaway from all this as it relates solely to uh, what's under our purview, which is one of the four elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, all the demographic data that you have covered not just the elementary school, but the middle and high school. Yes. And even though we're four adjacent towns, the, the demographics do vary. Mm -hmm. And my gut feeling is that Sunderland tends to be the outlier, but I'm, you know, I'm not familiar with the current data. Um, so, my sense looking at the demographic data there is that it's only marginally re relevant for things we would look at just at our elementary school. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to measure uh, perhaps uh, changes in demographics over some period of time, uh, again, that would be difficult to draw conclusions that we could say apply to our school as opposed to the district. Correct. And, and, and then, secondly, it seems in going through this that uh, the bulk of all the other data that is here is drawn from the middle and high school, 
work that you've done. Because I, you know, whether it's the testing or whether it's the AP stuff or whether uh, it's, you know, you're doing student interviews with the middle and the high school, probably, probably for good reasons, but yes. that's, uh, that's fact. Yes. And so I look at this and I say, okay, you know, what's our, uh, what's our game plan as, a, as an elementary school committee uh, to take from this in terms we, uh, of how we are uh, monitoring the uh, administration mm-hmm. and, how they, uh, and how they progress from here. Because I don't see much of anything that tells them what the starting point is. Starting point meaning what you found. Mm-hmm. Most of it, does, there's very little in there that I can see that, that says, this is where Sunderland is at. And in all honesty, we, you know, we try to be friendly with the district, Mm-hmm. I care about something. Sure. Okay. And so, you know, I have a hard time not being disappointed. You, you and, and I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, and that's why I started off by saying it's a system. So we look at it as a system as a whole. You guys are obviously one of the unique system districts in the country that have this union formation. Okay. Uh, but no, unfortunately, we don't look at it that way. Now, your superintendent probably knows those data that you're talking about. And as you move forward uh, and look at these data points, you'll see clearly what affects Sunderland and what doesn't affect Sunderland. And uh, you know, that's one of the things that uh, you know where to start. Uh, they do have. Uh, this matrix that they have created and started the leadership team. They showed it to me this morning. And Sarah Lauren and I talked about creating an equity plan and some characteristics of what that would look like. Uh, so they've started the work, as he was saying. They've already started it. So part of the work that's going to happen is going to allow you to look at Sunderland individually as, a, as, as an individual school and as a part of the system. Okay? But you're correct that the report itself looks at it system-wide. We do not break it down. Uh, yeah, but most of what you look at system-wide is for the older grades. Yeah, I mean, as far as interviews, there are certain things, yeah. I mean, yeah. <coughs> the idea with the elementary, I think the biggest takeaway for the elementaries would be, um, you know, again, it goes back to that access and opportunity. And, uh, you know, you know, that would be, you know, a question, you know, an equity question would be, <coughs> where are our AP students coming from? Are they coming from all elementaries equally, or are some elementaries more represented than others? That's a data point that you may not have access to yet, but that would probably be something that you could pull and plan. So, in a sense, the report is looking at elementaries from that perspective of, this is where the work starts to create those opportunities. For students to succeed. Well, and those elementary schools feed into the high school. Yeah, I mean, that's it. High that's school, it. So you do have Sunderland students who have fed into the yeah. larger system. Sure, but I don't. I don't really recall in my time on the committee ever getting any uh, feedback on here's how Sunderland students are performing at Frontier. You know, one, two, five, six years later. Yeah, you probably don't have the ability to pull the data like that. I understand. I'm not saying this. I'm not even saying that we ought to because I'm not saying it's worth the effort. But we're just, you know, there's, there's, I'm just looking at the paucity of useful data in this report for our particular purposes. I'm not saying district wide, there's not some good okay. stuff here. And, and what I actually really like is uh, the push that I'm sensing, mm-hmm. that you give to our administration, our teachers, the rest of our staff, that, you know, this is this is serious, this is long-term, this is something you've made progress on, but there's a lot more to go. Yeah. You know, all of this is something where sometimes you need someone outside to just tell you that, but we've also, well, I guess it reminds me of one other question I, I'd have, and this would be to, to Darius, and that is that my sense is that this all started when we got the letter from the Frontier alumni. 
on this release letter and said, told them we got a problem here. That you know, about the same time. It's, it's all around, around that same time. Around yeah. the same time, but I think the letter was the thing that kicked off. You know, the district really taking this stuff seriously. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if in the now it's been several years. I don't remember what. I guess that was two, two or three years ago. I like that two and a half years ago. Um, whether there's been any communication of whatever form with you know any members of those original alumni class of doing that in terms of you know what do you hear what do you see you know it's just, are we doing are we doing are we making progress are we addressing the things that caused you to complain so much you know rightly so and and has there been any back with them to sort of see or, or with newer, you know, recent graduates, alumni now, to, to find to get some sort of sense of what they think about the progress or lack of it. Right. And we have not done graduate polls. Of I'm just saying it's something that you know I'm curious about in a while. That while you're the people that complain, they really take they really get the credit for you know, being here and all this because mm -hmm. you know and and when they complained, I thought it was. Really great that our administration took them seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, really took them seriously, rather than sort of like giving lip service and, and and then not really doing much. Yeah. Okay, and I think it's it's, but you know, there's always sort of nice, be nice to check in with the original complainers and say, you know, what do you think? Are we still screwing up? Take a pulse. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 So anyway, thank you. Sure. <laughs> One of our remote members is right Oh, again. I'm sorry. Any Europe? Uh, Ann Curtis, Deerfield Elementary School Committee. I'm going to try to be brief because I'm double dutying with mothering um, now, but there's two comments I just want to make, and then I do have a question. One of the comments that I, I think that maybe we're, you know, we're sitting here as privileged folks, sort of after hours, volunteering our time to sit here and listen to this presentation, which is really good, and ask questions. But I think one of the things as school committees we should be thinking about as we move forward with voting on decisions and, you know, equity plans and looking at more data is how are we bringing people to the table who don't have the privilege to come to meetings like this? So that's, I think that's maybe a challenge for us as school committee members to sort of take this to heart and really make an effort to bring people to the table who don't hold the same privileges that we do being here tonight discussing privilege and equity. Secondly, I also, I think for elementary school folks, even though we don't have as much data no data is data, I think, from my perspective. And I think it just emphasizes the importance of the work that we have to sort of send people to middle school, and my kids are coming, <laughs> and high school um, better prepared. And then the, the question I actually have um, for the presenter is with schools who are, <laughs> this is Theo, with schools who are operating at a cultural proficiency, do they have like a dedicated diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, or is it a shared responsibility to carry an equity plan forward based on your experience in other districts? So I haven't seen any schools operating at that top level. Okay. It is common. It's not common. It is becoming more common to have an equity officer. Now, those are in larger school districts. I'll tell you. Uh, when I say they're equity officers, these are districts of 10, 20, 30,000 students. Okay. And they usually hold, uh, I did a, I, I think the first district I did may have been about 16,000 students, but it was a majority minority school district. Uh, and they hired an equity officer. It's the first time I saw one. I guess I kind of want to tag off of Jessica's comment a little bit in that I think that I would hope that you take away from this a little bit that, that 
that you kind of guide the narrative. The questions that you ask and the things that you measure are what you're saying is important for us to be looking at. That's what our community is hearing is important to be looking at. Things like the SAT may not necessarily be a measure of achievement. And you have a role, especially in diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. to address all the other measures of achievement that can more accurately both capture the achievement of the students, but also encourage everyone to, to get the students to a space of achievement, even if it's not an SAT. Sure. And I think that that's important to broaden, I think, your presentation and the things that you guys do to look at that because it's no. it's very limited to just look at those at honors classes and AP and SATs that only captures a subset of folks yes. that either that, that yeah it's a very other things lens. and look that's before you look at some of the inherent problems yeah. with those measuring statistics yes yeah. I think I would hope that that's something that you take away from that as you guys look at your presentation and audits yeah I'll definitely take that idea back and. Bounce it off. Especially on an equity audit. Again, that curriculum audit is truly geared toward the test. And that's, but yeah, this is a little bit different. So I can appreciate the comments. I have a question, it's kind of for Darius, but Benita and Jim about wishing that we had sample equity plans to look at from other districts that Jim would. Mm -hmm. deemed successful and appropriate so that we could model ours on it. Do you have access to other districts' successful equity plans that all the school committee members can yeah. have? Look at ask Jim. No, so what we're doing, that's what I was talking with Sarah Moore about today, is we are uh, working on developing some criteria. Uh, we have criteria, we're going to tweak it a little bit and kind of individualize it. And I'm going to help create, help you create your plan. Thank you. I, I thought that your services ended tonight. You're, you're continuing after this to support us? Because I know Sarah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes. I was just going to um, say, just because this could be something that we can certainly talk to some others while we're at the uh, Massachusetts, you know, the yeah. school committee. Um, summit on the Cape is, you know, to find out from them what they're doing um, and get their plan. Even if they're not fabulous, it's something to start with and look at and say, oh, we want to add something like this or we don't to do something like that. So that's something that I'm happy to help us do there. So what are the roles of the committees going forward now. The administration is working on the equity cycle bridge back to committees. Now it's a policy subcommittee as we're going forward. Um, what else can we do? <laughs> Where do we go from here for our responsibility? I know with the recommendations, a lot of them had responsibility with partly with the committee. Logistically, what do we do? Right, so it's all of your responsibility, this is all your responsibility, right? Because you drive what I'm driving. Uh, to, and, you know, so basically I report to you so that you, and I usually try to set up like this is what, I try to lead and you try to, and you advise on that leading that's the direction you want to go. So the next step is, so we do have policy work to be done um, and revising some policy. We have a lot of policy work to be done alone outside of it, you know what I mean? And then looking at, while we go through the policy work, is there, um, you know, is there modifications we can do that falls into this? So this you know, policy runs the full can. Um, you know, I'm talking about creating an equity plan that will come back um, to, to all of you, to review, to question, to say, you know, talk about the different things and, and, and where do we want to put our resources? Right, so you guys control resources, and you control budget, and you control myself, right? So, um, so that, that's basically the kind of the path moving forward, and then you know processes, and you know within all the recommendations, you know we talk about, you know we hear you they're talking about the different, like, looking at test scores and those kind of things, but looking at the recommendations, those alone we can pull away from even the report. They're all very, you know, they're all very succinct. Like, yeah, 
I guess we could be doing that. Yeah, I guess we, there's not many that are like, why would we do that? You know what I mean? Like, this, you know, so we'll, we'll put together that of what we're going to be working on and then timeline of that. So you're all going to be like, uh, give me feedback on the timeline of it, the, the, you know, the, the checks and balances of it. So that's basically what your roles are, unless you want to change your roles a bit. I, I guess what I foresee. Sorry, I was looking at Laura too. She was leaning forward. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence about saying something, but after you haven't said it, I'm just not. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, like, there's check in within this work, and this is kind of where I want this work to go is it be part of everyday work that we do. You know, so when we talk about, when Laura came back, you know, came to elementary schools and was talking about new curriculum um, last month. Where is that going to be? Where does that going to be? There should be a question being asked. Can we have the same board by the committee? Okay, um, you know those are kind of things. Like as we go through each thing, those are kind of questions that you know, we want the, you folks to be keeping on your minds as we're putting things through. And then we have an equity plan that we're going to have to monitor every year. It fits into a strategic plan, it fits into our school improvement plans, right? We got all these plans. In coordinating them is. is what I have to try to figure out how that exactly works because um, because a lot of plans there's only so many administrators to create those plans. Um, and so that's kind of where I see it because um, your role is, you know, in school, we, their basic three points is policy, budget, and me, right? And so um, yep. those, you know, those that's kind of how it works. So within budget, there's going to be monetary things that are connected with this. We look at professional, some of it is kind of baked in. But we give you a professional development plan to show the amount of money. This district spends a lot of money on professional development. We talk about the time we give to teachers for professional development early these Fridays. That's a significant gift um, toward, you know, the, the, it's a tax gift, you know what I mean? It says that we value that. So those are kind of those things that fall within policy that makes change, is that we created time and money to record the six. So when we give you the professional development plan, you know, you're going to be helping coordinate that. So, and I can keep going and going, but I think you kind of get an idea of where I see it going. Um, a, I've never done this before either. So, you know, there's going to be the, Darius, what, what is this? You know, like, you know, can we talk about, you know, pulling this back or pushing this forward and that kind of stuff too. Um, and from what it sounds like, we're kind of a, a leader in putting this all together in this way. A lot of schools are really, are getting on board with, and just talking to superintendents and states putting out different programs. Um, getting on board, looking at equity, that kind of thing. And so we also be looking over our shoulder at other schools where they do it, still their good stuff. Um, it, but also, I think it means we're also leading the way to have. We talk about you know, when you look right now on NASC and you look up um, equity and equity um, policies. You go to the policy page. There's not much that looks like ours. But we stole some of the different language or ties to a plan. Foundation statement that look like ours, you know what I mean? Like, so we're doing things that I don't see we're ahead of the curve, but we're on the forefront of things, you know what I mean? Um, and we also come from a very unique district where, at least to be very honest with that, we're talking about 84 percent white. You know, I had the comment, What do you know about diversity? And, and I think you did a nice job today. So, there's a lot of other things when we talk about diversity, and these are the other groups of your students, and it is your job to make sure every group is successful. It's my job as well. I'm just talking about your job. Um, but in, in talking about, so don't just look at, you know, ethnicity, race, and, you know, those kind of things. There are other categories that we can make sure, too, that, you know, our, our, our schools meet everyone's needs. And, and, and a lot of that, when you talk about test scores and stuff, I do want to bring back that it's the fact that we don't have a lot of data to give. I can't say, what is the GPA of every, you know, student of color in the ninth grade? You know, what is the GPA, or excuse me, I'm very close to but you know, 11th grade, you know, those kind of, we don't have the ability to pull that out easily. Because um, that would be the other thing. Do we have the ability to adjust our data points? Like, do we have the ability to put in more points in the programs that we have in place to be able to Before this year, us? no. But right now we're in the by your software that we're going to allow to do that so that we can start looking at other data points that is different than MCAS. It's different than you know those you know, those, those kind of MCAS is easy because they give it to you in a nice download right. format that can go in nicely into reports and that kind of thing. But and then also you know, we look at GPAs and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, if we look at some of the stats we saw on the screen. Um, we do have a gender um, uh, disparity of grades in the school. 
you know, in, in not, not only are, are, are in talking about Frontier now, um, that are in um, AP courses, but the top 10 GPAs are predominantly, predominantly female. You know, so, because at least the other take more APs, you get a higher GPA, you get higher GPA, you know, that kind of thing, so the top 10 of the class are primary female. You know, but, you know, so like, those are data things that we have to look at as well as looking at other, not just AP, it was easy because it's one of those stat things, but um, we're in the midsection. How are those kids moving? Starting from the sorry. Yeah. Direct the question, sorry. Is that <laughs> uh, there will be follow up. Oh, okay. it was, I think I deal with the discussion all the time. That's good. I just want to check. Is there any more? I want your question about open school committee. Yes. Um, the DIA yeah, said this, but I just want to highlight how what I would find it um, supportive if there if we evolved to have a system that's a system of questions that were asked around decisions or issues like. Um, other equity issues, just in general, that we have to consider. Just making pause at time to think about it before we vote and before we move away from a topic by presenting our curriculum on MCAT scores. Because, um, well, for a lot of reasons. For one thing, the dominant views continue to be restated because it's a safe place for that. And it's important to ask what are some, you know, my, some perspectives that might not come out in this room because they're a memory perspective. Or, um, and just to make time for that, and if we can't generate examples, I think it begins to open it up. And also just to reassure, I think, administrators that it's wealth of information because being invited to like, address equity helps helps know that we're all pushing this together and that we're working with school committee teachers not, you know, not kind of flat, but we're really all in it working together. So, a sincere opportunity to systematically say whether the equity issues that should come up and be just change the dynamic around it. I think it would be very supportive. I just wanted to say a couple things, but I was waiting a long time, so now my list is a little longer. <laughs> But to reiterate and kind of co-op what you were saying, Missy, I think it's really important to keep, to come back around to what is emphasized in this equity audit and that we didn't have specific voices of people of color, of LGBTQ, specifically pulled out. And we got really great data around SES students, which is great and so important for us to look at in, these, in our communities. Mm -hmm. But there are other groups that are really suffering and need a voice. And this, in a way, diminished their voice even more because it wasn't held high. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece that I really encourage school committee to, as you're thinking about where are we going with this, how are we bringing those voices to the forefront so we can hear them and then respond. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing on my list. I also wanted to say that there is a lot of data, speaking as an elementary school teacher, that we do collect and we do look at in different ways, you know, whether we're looking at SES students or now we want to, you know, bring this into but we have data collection all the time and it just wasn't really asked for in this audit. True. So there is a lot no, of data. Sense. That isn't Tons of data. just the end test score. So yeah. that's another piece that, again, as school committee members, if you're asking for, please bring us data in the principal report. Sorry, match up. <laughs> <laughs> to say, like, how are your how are our students doing in these different subgroups um, that we should bring forward? I also want to say, I know Darius is a very humble, humble guy. But there is a lot of amazing stuff that he's doing, that our administrative team is doing, that we have done in the past three years, and to just be as transparent about that stuff as we can and put it in the forefront. Um, there were a lot of comments in your presentation of like, this is happening behind the scenes, and we're working on this behind the scenes. People need to know that because that tells them it's a priority for us and that it's not going away, which is what some people hope for, I think, but it's not going away. We're working on it, and we will continue to prioritize this, and we're doing good things. So 
I encourage you, Darius, to just brag about what you do and what you're bringing to our district because it's, it is, we are at the forefront. We really are. And then the last thing I will say about the alumni letter is if we haven't wrapped back around, and I would love to see something in the system that does kind of create an opportunity anyway for people to give feedback. I personally have asked a few and I if they would redraft a letter because I think it's important to hear. Um, and that's hard because then people go off to college and they sort of like, high school, I'm going back there. <laughs> But it would be an interesting thing to encourage or make a space on our website or something that would we could hear from those those people again. But it, and makes, it makes me think of exit polls, right? Like yes. you're exactly. exactly thinking what went well, what went wrong. Like it would be interesting to include that kind of thing as you're leaving our system. Give us some feedback. <laughs> so before before awesome. they go off. But, yeah. Yeah. Right. So it'd be nice to know what the original office of the letter think about the work from them, but really we want to know what the current students are right. how can help affect them. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. We yeah, appreciate your questions, your shows, your passion for your kids. So it's wonderful. Yeah, motion check. Uh, yeah, I'll go along with the Yeah, 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 yeah